in the weeds with XRDP, PolKit, and a Zubuntu desktop server. This video is about permission issues that can arise when installing XRDP on an Ubuntu server that has a Zubuntu desktop installed. XRDP allows a Windows computer to make remote desktop connections to Linux clients. Once XRDP is installed on the Ubuntu server, permission issues are raised and PolKit is introduced. PolKit is a system service on Linux distributions that is used to assign user permissions. PolKit is frequently used to fine-tune permissions for network users. Permissions can cause issues when Windows makes remote connections to Linux. What this video covers, install of XRDP into an Ubuntu server with an Ubuntu desktop, introduction to PolKit, how to find PolKit policy files and actions, match between PolKit XML and PolKit PKLA files, how to write user-defined actions into PolKit PKLA files. It does not cover PolKit rules files. Requirements, an internet connection, a Zubuntu desktop server with minimum requirements, RAM, 4 gigabytes, a multi-core CPU, at least 2 gigahertz processor, storage, minimum of 3 or 4 gigabytes, local area network, LAN access, additional Windows computer on the same network with remote desktop enabled. Basically, you will need a Windows and Linux computer to practice using XRDP with PolKit permissions. Warning, if PolKit actions are implemented incorrectly, you can lock yourself out of your Linux machine or expose your Linux machine to outside attack. This is more of a background video with demonstrations. If you want to do hands-on practice with PolKit actions, I would recommend you build yourself a practice virtual machine. The next four slides contain additional sources of info or documentation, a list of the software used in making this video, and a disclaimer. If you wish, you can stop this video to read the slides, and I recommend that you read the disclaimer on this video. For installing XRDP, let's make sure that the Ubuntu slash Zubuntu desktop server has got the latest updates. So let me log in. Go up here to the Applications menu, Settings, scroll down to Software Updater, it checks for updates, and it says the software in this computer is up to date. So I'm ready to go ahead, click OK, go back to the Applications menu, go for the Terminal Emulator. Now this is black and it's actually got a gray, not a total white font. So I'm going to change the background to a white color and make the font a little bit bigger. But I'm not going to go through the whole explanation, so this will just go through real quickly. And if you want to, you can slow the video down and watch it at your leisure. Edit Preferences, Appearance, Font, change the font to 12, select, close, edit, preferences, colors, background, white, select, text color, black, select, close. So now I'm going to install XRDP sudo apt install xrdp-y for yes. Of course it asks for your password. Now it's installed and to automatically start xrdp anytime this machine is started use sudo systemctl enable xrdp and if I want to check the status of this, I would simply say sudo system ctl status xrdp. And it says active and running. It gives you some other information here. Now to get out of here, we're going to have to use control C. 
But if it's not active, you would simply use the same command, but instead of status, you would just simply say start. Now one other setting you're going to have to do to make sure that on a remote connection you get the uh, Zubuntu desktop, you're going to have to actually create a file, .xsession file, and enter xfce4-session into that file. So in order to do that, echo xfce4-session, direct it to tilde slash dot x session and if you want to verify that it's there you could open up a uh, text editor in this case I'm going to use vim dot x session and there it is uh, escape colon q for quit now one other thing I need to do is find the IP address because I'm going to make a connection here and I'm going to say IP space a and if I look down here I uh, see it's 192.168.50.7 and that's the address of my Ubuntu slash Zubuntu desktop server and I would keep a note of that or maybe write it down or something. So let's go check and make sure that this works. One thing that has to happen for XRDP to work is that I have to be logged out of it. So in order to do that I'll just simply do an INIT6 which will restart do a restart on the Ubuntu slash Zubuntu desktop server and it will restart. In the background here I've got a Windows machine and I'm going to open up remote desktop search for remote desktop. If you recall it was 192.168.50.7 I'm going to connect to it. It says the identity of the remote computer cannot be verified. I'm just simply going to ignore that. You can check this. Don't ask me again for connection to this computer. I'm simply going to click yes. I need to enter the username of the Ubuntu slash Zubuntu desktop server and a password for going to it. Click OK. On the remote desktop connection, you will notice your screen looks different. On my Ubuntu server with the Zubuntu desktop, if I try and exit this or shut down, you'll see that they do not work. So I'm unable to restart the desktop or turn it off. This is due to security policy permission settings, otherwise known as Polkit. Depending on how you've set up your Ubuntu server, you may have some additional or different issues. So what exactly is Polkit? It is a security policy system service implementation that gives non-root users permission to do a limited subset of permissions normally only given to a root user. These permissions are called actions and are a set of rules defined in policy files. This allows for a more granular set of permissions instead of unrestricted root access. Because of the complexity of Polkit, I am including a set of links in this video that do a better job of describing what Polkit is. It will also be listed in the description that accompanies this video. As I start thrashing around in the weeds, please keep in mind that all additional information applies specifically to Ubuntu, though generally Polkit is similar in all Linux systems. We'll open up a terminal and I'm going to do a sudo find base directory name and look for anything that ends in dot policy which are polkit files password and you see that there's quite a number of policy files here so let's see how many there are same command but this time I'm going to pipe it into NL number of lines so there are 97 lines. So if I look over this, I'm going to see that all policy files are in a USR shared directory or in a snap directory. Now generally you're not going to have to worry about all the snap directories because those are isolated from the rest of the operating system. So the only ones we're going to be concerned about are the USR, share, Paul kit, and actually actions directory. 
And that's where the system policy files are located. So if I want to find out how many system-wide policy files I have to deal with, I would simply do the same thing, but I would look in the USR directory. Hit enter. So from whacking at the weeds so far, I've deduced that there are 55 system-wide PolKit policy files. PolKit provides a lot of additional complexity, but my goal is to get to the point where a user, as a user, you can update a permission, which is commonly called an action in PolKit. So out of the 55 policy files, how many actions are there? To find a list of the actions, I would use the PolKit command, PK action, and there they are. So to find out how many actions there are, I would use PK action, and then again, pipe it into NL, and you'll see that there are 281 actions. And I will see that there are 281 system-wide actions associated with PolKit. In the next section, I will go into details of what a dot policy file looks like. So let's take a look at one of the dot policy files and see what a permission or action looks like. Since I was unable to power off or reboot my server, I'll look for a policy file that appears to address that. First, make sure I am in the directory where all the system-wide policy files are located. And to do that, I will go open up a terminal and do a cd usr share polkit action. I guess it's actions. Hit enter. And I'll do an ls. Pipe that into nl for number of lines. Hit enter. And so I've got 55 policy files. And if I scroll up in here, I can see I've got login policy file. So that's probably the one that I'm going to want. So I'm going to copy that. Right click. Copy. Go back to the terminal and do a cat. And then paste. And then I'm going to pipe that into less and hit enter. So I notice at the top three lines of this file that this is an XML 1.0 file with a doc type declaration. So if I scroll down this file, I'll have to use the uh, arrow key. I see that this is a large file, contains quite a number of actions. First, I'm going to look for an action this file probably keeps you from shutting down the computer. As I scroll down, probably something like power off. Oh, here it is, power off. So to locate the text containing power off, I'm going to go down here to the colon, type in Q to get out of this file. So if I wanted to locate where that power off is located in that file, I could use cat dash n to give me a number and then let me go paste it again and then again I put in a pipe only this time I'm going to use grep to find it and then key in power off with no spaces hit enter and it tells me line 168 so now I'm going to go cat paste it and pipe this into less again. And go to the colon in the bottom left and type in 168 G for go. So now I am at where power off starts. Or the first power off. So let me go over the major elements of a policy file. You can refer to both the written XML description and the action power off section in the policy file as I read the major elements. Some of the most important elements are vendor provides information about the organization responsible for the policy. You notice here I don't have a vendor listed. Action shows a unique idea of the action or permission. Description, what the policy does. Power off the system in this case. Message, additional information for the user. Authentication is required. Defaults, states the permissions or lack of permissions. Contains three settings, allow any, allow inactive, or allow active. And finally, annotate, provides additional information on the action, may assist in locating similar actions. Main thing 
I want to focus on here is the three settings of the defaults. Allow any, allow inactive, and allow active. There's a little confusion in the documentation I'm using. So from Arch Linux, it says inactive sessions are generally remote sessions, SSH, VNC, etc., whereas active sessions are logged directly into the machine on a TTY or an X display. Allow any is a setting encompassing both scenarios. And from the SUSE documentation, it says allow active is applied to users in an active session. An active session is a local login. Allow any is used for all other contexts. For example, for remote users logged in via SSH or VNC, and then finally from the man pages, allow any implicit authorizations that apply to any client. Allow inactive is implicit authorizations that apply to clients in inactive sessions on local consoles. And finally, allow active implicit authorizations that apply to clients in active sessions on local consoles. So there's a little bit of confusion as to which of the three settings allow any, allow inactive, and allow active refer to remote logins. Since both SUS and the man pages state that allow inactive and allow active refer to local login, I'm going to infer that allow any is the permission setting that refers to remote logins. This means that when I change the Paul kit settings for the remote login, Zubuntu desktop, I will only change the setting for allow any and leave allow active and allow inactive unchanged. Yes, I know this is a little confusing at first, but I'm also leaving links to PaulKit documentation in this video and links in the description below. Unfortunately, to change settings in Ubuntu, you have to be able to use PaulKit commands, which is an alternative method to determine what actions each policy takes. This means that changes will not be written in an XML file format. To view how this works, you use the pull kit PK action query. As before, I can list all my actions using PK action, pipe it into NL. So I'm going to quit my uh, policy file, type in Q in the bottom left. I'm going to use PK action, pipe it into NL. So basically, I've got 281 actions in all these policy files. I can also query each individual action with PK action. And in this case, I'm going to go up to 140 and I've got the power off action. So I'm going to copy that, right click, copy. And then I'm going to go PK action dash V dash dash action dash ID. And then I'm going to paste this. And it gives me a warning, unsafe paste. I'm going to ignore the warning. Paste, hit enter. Now you notice that this query produces some of the same elements that I went over before in the XML file, description, message, vendor, etc. What is different is that you see the implicit term in the PK action query, but in the policy file, you see the word allow. From the Arch Linux PolKit documentation, the following values, no, yes, auth self, auth admin, auth self keep, and auth admin keep are currently valid. To keep it simple, when I write the PolKit files, that will allow me to reboot and turn off the remote connected Zubuntu server, I will only use yes or no. And finally, the next section of the video will cover how to change the PolKit settings on Ubuntu. Given all the previous background, I will now demonstrate how to change the pull kit settings on an Ubuntu derivative machine. First, I will remote desktop to my Zubuntu desktop server and verify that the power and reboot buttons do not work. 192.168.50.7 was the IP address. Click connect. Yes, name and password. Click OK. So now I'm in the Zubuntu server, and you'll see I'm connected through remote desktop. So now if I want to check restart, doesn't work. Shut down, doesn't work. So I'm going to cancel, and I'm going to open up a terminal emulator so I can work with that. And first thing I want to do is check the PKLA version by using PK 
action dash dash version and PK action version 0 0.105 is what I get. So I'm going to have to write the pull kit files in PKLA format and not in the current XML format that we've gone over before. Now, pull kit files written by a user should be installed in the forward slash etc forward slash pull kit dash one forward slash local authority directory and not in the forward slash usr forward slash share forward slash pull kit dash one directory because we don't want to overwrite any pull kit files that came with the Ubuntu server. The basic guidelines for where you should store any pull kit files you write should be in the 50 dash local dot d subdirectory and a full directory location for this is forward slash etc forward slash pull kit dash one forward slash local authority forward slash 50 dash local dot d. Also there's a naming convention for pull kit files. All the files you write should start with a number. The order in which the files are accessed depend on that number in ascending order. The lower numbers are accessed first. It would also be helpful to name the file a name that refers to the permission you are authorizing or denying. So let's write our first file. Let's take a look at the power off permission. In order to do that, I would do a pk action dash v dash dash action dash id and then I'm going to paste in the power off action. Hit enter and right here it is. The only change I'm going to really make in here and this implicit any is used to refer to a remote desktop connection I'm going to change auth admin keep to yes. Now it is possible to write a PKLA file with your favorite text editor and access the etc pull kit dash one local authority 50 dash local dot d directory using sudo su, but you can also use sudo bash dash c, which will execute the command from a string. In this case, the cat string creates a file with the name 41-allow-power-off.pkla in the 50-local.d directory. Then everything afterwards is input to the pkla file until the eof is seen. I will copy and paste the pull kit action into the command line, but you can also type it in just as well at the copy bash command and pass it into the command line. There is also a copy of this string in the description that accompanies this video. So rather than you watch me type it, maybe make an error, go to the EOF, hit enter, ask for my password. And so now let's see if it works. I go over here. So now shutdown should work. Look, shutdown and it works. Now, well, let's fix reboot. In order to fix reboot, I've got to uh, go back and since it's a virtual machine, restart my Ubuntu server. And it's going to take a second for... Uh... And I'm not going to log into it because I want to get into my uh, Windows and connect to it from my Windows machine. Click connect. Yes. And here I've used remote desktop to get into my Zubuntu server. Start the terminal again. I'm going to create a PKLA file. And this time I'm going to create a PKLA file that allows me to reboot. I'm simply going to paste it in as I did before. Paste. And you'll see again, result any is yes and everything else is pretty much the same. And this one is called 42 allow reboot. So this will be accessed after the power off. Then I'm going to hit enter for the EOF. And again, the password. And if I go right here and access. So now I should be able to restart it. And you'll see that the restart works, is working. Remote desktop connection comes up and let me give it a minute or two to uh, restart. Yeah. There we go. So now I've verified I can reboot the server from the RDP connection. So there it is. The Zubuntu desktop server has rebooted.
This video is simply a rough ramble into the weeds introduction on how to solve basic pull kit issues when using an XRDP remote desktop connection on an Ubuntu derivative. I've only demonstrated how to change two very obvious issues. This video demonstrates how to solve issues with power off and reboot. If you are having another issue with XRDP and Paul Kit on Ubuntu, you'll have to start digging into the Paul Kit weeds yourself. Hopefully, this video is giving you some direction on where to start. Thank you for watching this. If you have any questions on this video, please ask them in the comments below. Also, if there is a video you would like to see made, please let me know. While I can't promise anything, I will try and look into it. Cheers.